Well, uh, thank you so much, Wolfgang, for this uh, very uh, kind introduction. Uh, let me thank everybody who has been involved in organizing this wonderful event. I find it really inspiring that here in Germany, we have people from the arts, we have people from education, we have people from political theory, uh, we have people even from law uh, who, to deal with this very complex and challenging set of issues. Uh, I find that really inspiring. So uh, it is inspiring to find myself uh, addressing an audience that consists of people from all these different fields, as opposed to the situation I more often find myself in when I find myself talking particularly to lawyers. So uh, uh, thank you very much for organizing this wonderful event. And it seems to be a feature of Berlin because almost a year ago, I was invited by the HKW for a similar event. And it was inspiring to interact with writers and artists and uh, political, uh, political theorists and sociologists in trying to deal with these questions. Uh, let me pers uh, personally thank uh, uh, Wolfgang, Karina, Anna, who got me a ticket to the Berlin Philharmonic last night against, despite all the difficulties, um, and, um, and uh, Judith uh, for organizing this particular event um, uh, and for uh, enabling me to be here. The topic, I can't actually see the topic of my own uh, slides. <laughs> so maybe I should uh, talk in this way. <laughs> uh, the, the topic uh, or the title of a talk is supposed to be revealing. And the title of my talk is Decolonization, Reparations, Co Cosmopolitanism Towards the Third World International Law. Um, what this really reveals is confusion and indecision on my part because I did not know which of these particular areas to speak about, whether to talk about decolonization, which is a large topic, or reparations, which certainly I understood is a topic of great importance in the current setting here in Germany, but also much more broadly, or to talk about cosmopolitanism. And of course, uh, talking about cosmopolitanism in Germany is a little like uh, you know, calls to Newcastle, because cosmopolitanism, after all, is one of the great export industries of Germany, a little like BMW or something like that. So many of the great philosophers of Germany uh, have furthered this particular tradition of cosmopolitanism. I also, I must say, feel almost redundant, because those wonderful uh, opening remarks by Mr. Odenthal, by Mr. Kruger, by Nikita, Davan, and by Wolfgang covered everything pretty much that I wanted to say. <laughs> You know, so we heard about the centrality of colonialism just for the modern world. And that is a topic that I have been trying to explain to people uh, throughout my scholarship as a member of Third World Approaches to International Law. But here it seems to be almost the premise, the beginning of this whole event. So do I really need to talk about that? Uh, so, uh, and similarly, uh, Thomas Kruger's uh, comments about education and the significance of education. Absolutely, uh, you know, I could not agree more. Because as Nikita pointed out, so much of the history of countries have taken place, especially European countries, so much of that history has taken place overseas. So it is a huge disservice to the people in that country, the students of that country, if they don't understand the overseas aspects of their particular history. Uh, in the United States, for example, uh, I, I teach uh, students, very dedicated students, very well-meaning students who want to do human rights work, transitional justice, uh, post-conflict resolution, and so forth. And then I ask a question, I say, have any of you heard of a place called Laos? Laos, in Southeast Asia. Not many people have heard that. But it's interesting to know that Laos was bombed very intensely by the United States. So much so that I think there were more bombs dropped on Laos, Laos possibly, than on Germany. <laughs> it's an incredible fact. And yet, my students in the United States are not particularly aware of that, and yet want to engage with the world. Can we see the complication in these circumstances? <laughs> or can we see the complication of a British student who has not heard of the Balfour Declaration? Now, it is not the fault of those students. I should make that absolutely clear. They are well-meaning. They want to be educated. It is up to us, the educators, to make sure that that history is told. So uh, this is just to point to some of the issues here. As I said, I couldn't decide which particular topic to talk about, but let me give a summary of, now that I put it on the board, at least now that it's up there, I suppose I should try and give some account of it, so let me attempt to do so. 
What is the connection between decolonization, reparations, and cosmopolitanism? So with decolonization, uh, here what I'm talking about is a project that Third World Approaches International Law, it's wonderful to see so many of my colleagues here, that we have been engaged in for a long time. Because our view has been that the teaching of international law, the practice of international law, is based on a particular vision of the world. And it is a Western vision of the world. It is a Western vision of the world which does not properly take into account the significance of imperialism for the making of international law. Now, of course, the interesting thing is that all of us educated in international law were educated in the Western tradition. So when looking at our own history, we found ourselves looking at our own history from a lens that came from outside. And so the problem we face is how do we change this situation? What are the conceptual tools that are needed to enable us to better understand the relationship between imperialism and international law? That is the challenge that we faced. So what we are challenging is the conventional story about the relationship between imperialism and international law. The conventional story of imperialism and international law, it's a whole mouthful, I wish I can abbreviate it. Imperialism and international, imperialism and international law, A-A-I-L or something like that. Uh, the conventional story is something like, well, international law was made in the West. It was a creation of the West. It spread out to the non-Western world and in spreading out to the non-Western world, it brought enlightenment, it was mentioned, to the non-Western world that was lacking in this particular character of rationality, efficiency, productivity. And the argument about imperialism is that imperialism is a thing of the past. Decolonization took place from the 1940s onwards. It was a great project of the United Nations to bring about decolonization. And as a result of that, imperialism is no longer an issue that we should actually study or interrogate. It is the past. Now, um, in that context, we would argue that imperialism is fundamental to the making of international law. But what is really interesting is the way in which this centrality has been concealed throughout the time in which conventional scholarship has been continuously attempting to promote international law. And as several of you pointed out, Wolfgang and Nikita, at least for my part, I don't want to condemn the entirety of international law. International law is a reality. It can be useful. It is a question of how it can be made useful in particular circumstances. So it is in that context that we are talking about decolonization. And there's a big debate taking place, not only here perhaps, but certainly in South Africa, about how to decolonize our thinking about international law. Now, I know that this audience is an audience which consists of people from many disciplines. So, so let me try and use a very simple an metaphor or analogy, at least I hope it's simple, uh, to try and explain my approach to international law. We think of international law as a person. This person is a very good person. This person has, does important work, say, for a government service, and is very generous towards his, her friends, and provides continuous assistance and is a wonderful family member and volunteers at the local church and lives at least, ex at least or, or, or you know, helps with soccer training or whatever it is. Think of your own particular, uh, particular activity that uh, you would uh, consider in this situation. And so international law could be seen in this way, as benevolent, as a force that actually uh, is there to remedy injustice. So international law is this wonderful person. We would all like to be introduced to this person. We would all like to be friends with this person. We might all perhaps even want to be like this person when we grow up. But underneath this, underneath this all, there is a dark and terrible crime that is fundamental, that is the means by which this person has become so wealthy, generous, benevolent, and accepted and inspiring. There is this awful crime. And so then there is this whole difficulty of living this exemplary life while being aware of this awful crime. And in the case of international law, that awful crime is imperialism. And so my argument about reparations is that reparations challenges more directly than any other 
campaign or initiative of international law. It challenges very directly and threatens the very identity and personality of that individual by threatening to reveal all in terms of that dark past, which, of course, any sensible individual want, would want to keep hidden. So I hope that metaphor gives us some idea of why reparations is so difficult to achieve in the context of international law. I am a lawyer. I was going to speak in more doc doctrinal terms about a particular case of reparations, of the attempt to bring about reparations. It is the closest attempt I am aware of, at least in the field of public international law, where one country sued another for colonial exploitation. And the country involved is a country called Nauru. Have any of you heard of a place called Nauru? Hands up, please. Thank you, I'm glad. Uh, many of you have heard of it. And it, it is significant because Nauru was at one time a German protectorate. It is part of Germany's history. It is part of Germany's imperial history, just as Southwest Africa is. So I was going to talk about some of the technical aspects of that case, just to highlight this problem about how would international law try to block reparations, given that reparations threatens to expose this entire character of international law, the criminal past, that would otherwise, you know, that would spoil, expose the career of someone who has been so successful and who is so well-loved, international law. My second argument about reparations, and I'm making this very crudely because uh, I don't have much time, is the argument that reparations is taking place right now on an ongoing basis. <coughs> but it is reparations not paid by the colonizers to the colonized. The reparations are being paid by the poor world to the rich world. And if we look at the whole structure of international economic law, tracing it from its beginnings, from the time of Grotius, we would see how certain ideas of property, of commerce, of investment, and the particular ideas and the legal technologies developed to protect those ideas of property and so forth, have actually continued on to the present. So my argument about reparations is, reparations continues on. It is the poor world that is making massive payments to the rich world. Think about the level of debt being suffered in the poor world. All this as a result of loans that are supposed to provide assistance to countries in the poor world. So that's the argument I want to make about reparations. The argument about cosmopolitanism is an argument I've made already. And so this argument is something to the effect of, if we take seriously the claim, the possibility, I would say it is a possibility, I think it can be persuasively argued, that imperialism has fundamentally shaped international law, it should not surprise us that imperialism then devises the mechanisms to prevent reparations. That should not surprise us at all. But having done or gone through this whole process, if we expose the colonial origins of international law, if we trace all the different ways in which those colonial origins have shaped the present, what then is left of international law? And that is a project of reconstruction. And that is what, again, many of us TWAIL scholar, scholars are engaged in. How would we reconstruct an international law once we expose ourselves to this terrible knowledge? And bravely go forth. No, that sounds like Star Wars. I don't want to use Star Wars. <laughs> but actually, uh, something more classic, you know, something more sort of aristocratic. And how do we pursue it from this point onwards? Can we bring ourselves to actually face this possible truth, or even consider this to be the truth? And here we encounter a real existential issue, because many of us have devoted our lives to international law. We entered international law thinking this will enable us, empower us, to bring justice to people. And then the awful thought emerges that maybe international law could also be the source of injustice. It's a huge threat to our very identity and our professional existence almost, to, su to suddenly think, I'm not the good person, I'm possibly the bad person. <laughs> I was thinking, only this morning, I think it's a little like, you know, Oedipus Rex, so not Star Wars, Oedipus Rex, that's a bit more classic. Something like, do we pursue the truth unto the end? You know, remember with Oedipus, he thought he was going to solve this huge problem that afflicted the, his city of Thebes. 
Oedipus the king, the king, the sovereign. International law is all about sovereigns. And he wants to find the solution to this problem. And I remember, it's been a while since I read the play uh, or saw the play. And remember the shepherd say, saying to Oedipus, you do not want to know the truth. Just leave things right now. And Oedipus says, no, I need to know the truth. And then when he finally discovers the truth, he realizes he is the problem, not the solution. And how does he deal with that awful knowledge? And so the question then is, when we talk about cosmopolitanism, can we reconstruct international law based on this awful knowledge? Now, I believe that, in fact, there is this close connection between imperialism and international law. You may not do so. But that is the task that I would say is left to us in terms of the whole issue of cosmopolitanism. It can't be an abstract cosmopolitanism that is enunciated in the United Nations Charter, you know, which talks about well-being and which talks about, very powerfully, about the scourge of war and which talks about you know, all mankind is one in many ways. That's one form of cosmopolitanism. But if international law is going to be the vehicle by which that cosmopolitanism is going to be achieved, then we need to acquire a truthful account of what international law is. And then can we create a cosmopolitanism in that way? Now, it seems paradoxical that someone who is a third world international lawyer is now making the claim, which I am making, that in fact it is the third world approach to international law that is truly universal. It is the third world approach to international law that is truly cosmopolitanism or cosmopolitan because it tries to develop this broader vision of international law. It tries to work from the ground up rather than through from abstractions down. The other reason why I would say this is because I would contest the claim being made by a former president of the World Bank, Robert Zelik. Robert Zelik, a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, said something like, there is no longer a third world. <laughs> because everyone now is the first world. And there are some very prominent examples of countries that have succeeded, such as Singapore, which is uh, you know, where I'm based at the moment. I would suggest the reverse argument. I would say, now, everywhere is the third world or we would find the third world everywhere. And now what I find interesting is that problems that were previously thought to be specific and peculiar to the first, I'm sorry, to the third world, problems of inequality, problems of social dislocation, problems of nationalism, all these problems, austerity measures, uh, you know, uh, upstate New York, um, you know, uh, my colleague Macau can talk about this a little, uh, perhaps in more detail, hopefully not in relation to Buffalo, but I was visiting certain towns in upstate New York, and I suddenly thought, this is structural adjustment, this is what it looks like, and it's happening in the heart of the United States. And what we can see is that nationalism, which has been a huge problem to developing countries, because of the inequalities and social dislocation caused by globalization, that is a problem that we now find in the United States. Or in Brexit, or we can see Brexit as a result of this. So I would say that it is third world international lawyers who have been focused on this problem right from the beginning, instead of adopting a sanguine idea of international law saying, well, more trade agreements, everyone is going to win. Thank you very much. That's all we need to do. So that is, that is the basis of my claim. So I, that's, my, that's my argument. Maybe I can stop there. I don't have to go through the 25 slides <laughs> which I made for this purpose. Um, you know, um, and maybe we can just have a discussion. Um, all right, I made those slides, so let me just quickly run, quickly run through them. Um, this, an, an event that took place very close by, this is, of course, the famous portrait of the Peace of Westphalia. The, the Treaty of Munster? Munster and Osnabrück. Oh, Os and Osnabrück. So I'm not sure which one this is. Um, but um, here what I'm trying to do is to try and understand why it is that imperialism has been understood in a particular way. And my argument is that this date, this event, defines the entire perspective from which we view international law. And 
at least in conventional histories of international law, the argument is this event is important because it creates the sovereign state. And the problem of the creation of the sovereign state is that we then create a world which is inhabited by multiple sovereign states, and this world lacks an overarching sovereign who can enforce the law and make it real. It's the most simple, elementary, common criticism of international law. International law is not law because there is no proper enforcement. There is no proper enforcement because there is no overarching sovereign. So the problem that the great theorists of international law have focused on is how do we claim that international law exists in a situation where there is no overarching sovereign? And that is the paradigm that has haunted the discipline. And we can see that we can think of this, the United Nations, as being one approach to the problem. You know, even if there are sovereign states, perhaps we could coordinate among them to try and make sure that some kind of order comes into existence. And we would like this institution, the International Court of Justice at The Hague, to be involved in establishing the rule of law among sovereign states. So that's the classic idea of international law. The problem of international law is the problem of enforcement. And what we need is more international law, better institutions, better courts. And we would like to work in those institutions and courts to help this process of enforcement. Now, the great theorist behind this all was Hugo Grotius. And he was an extraordinary man. And uh, he died before the Peace of Westphalia. But his book, The Rights of War and Peace, was the theoretical foundation for the new world order that came into existence. And in this world order, as I said, the basic idea about imperialism is, well, you know, sovereignty is a liberation. European states had sovereignty. European states had enlightenment. And European states took sovereignty and enlightenment with them to the non-European world. And international law came into existence globally as a result. Now, the interesting thing about Grotius is that he is not only the theorist of the treaty, or at least the theorist of you know, the event um, of the creation of the sovereign state and his articulation of natural law. But there's another aspect of Grotius. Uh, this is a map that doesn't show very well. But Grotius was a lawyer for an entity called the Dutch East India Company. So, in fact, his first work was written in defense of the activities of the Dutch East India Company as a result of the uh, ships of that company capturing a Portuguese vessel and capturing a treasure worth something like half the gross national product of England in that, in that year, 1602 or 1603. The Dutch had to defend their actions, which would have been condemned as piracy. And so in order to defend their actions, they summoned the brilliant young man, I think he was called the genius of Delft, and they said, please, can you provide us with the legal advice that would defend the rights of our company? So Grotius's first great work, The Free Sea, was about defending the rights of a corporation. Corporations preceded sovereign states in terms of their presence in the international order. And my argument here would be, um, but we need really good scholarship to do this, but my suggestion is Grotius's writings in the Free Sea influenced his writings in the rights of war and peace. Can we see that? Because the same issues were involved. Who can make war? What is legal personality? What is property? So those issues were first theorized in relation to a corporation, in relation to an event that took place not in Westphalia, but an event that took place much closer to where I work, and that is Singapore. This event took place off the coast of Singapore. But can we see how, it, if we focus on that event as the foundation of theory, I believe there's a very close relationship between history and theory, that particular events generate theory. And when it, those particular events generate theory, it, specific events take on a universal character. Can we see that argument? Or does that make, argument make sense? If we focus on a different event and look at the issues generated by that different event, then our perspective, the lens which we use to understand international law would be different. So I'm suggesting one lens would be the event in 1603 that took place off the coast of Singapore, and we can see the ex extraordinary trading network in that map established by the Dutch East India Company. 
I would argue that the Dutch East India Company created the modern world, but I don't have time to elaborate on that. <laughs> it was the forerunner of globalization. It was an extraordinary entity, and most extraordinary, quite apart from its technology, was the fact that it had the greatest international lawyer that ever lived justifying its actions. <laughs> There's another event we can focus on. And uh, again, I feel a little awkward about using this because I use it so often that I'm tired of it myself, but it makes the point better than anything I could claim. This event, so I would say, let's not focus on 1648, let's focus on this event. This is the arrival of Columbus in the New World, 1492. And of course, it is the arrival of Columbus in the New World in the way that the West would like to imagine that it took place. <laughs> Now, we can see the natives immediately understanding the greatness of Columbus and bowing down before him and, and paying him homage. And there he stands with the, his banner unfurled and the cross towering above everything else. And, you know, that in itself suggests a particular hierarchy and um, a particular vision of the world. Now, what I want to do here is to focus on the language that was used by Columbus. This is why I keep going back to this slide, even though I'm tired of it. <laughs> because here, uh, this is what Columbus says. This is the first report he gives of his presence there in the New World. And he writes this to his sovereigns. Sir, as I know that you will be pleased at the great victory with which our Lord has crowned my voyage, I write this to you, from which you learn how, in 33 days, I passed the Canary Islands to the Indies with the fleet of the most illustrious king and queen our sovereigns gave to me. And there I found very many islands filled with people innumerable. And of them all I have taken possession for their highnesses by proclamation made and with royal standard unfurled. And no opposition was offered to me. To the first island which I found, I gave the name San Salvador in remembrance of the divine majesty who has marvelously bestowed all this. The Indians call it Guanahani. To the second, I give the name Isla de Santa Maria de Concepcion. To the third, Fernandina. To the fourth, Isabel. To the fifth, Isla Juana. And so to each one, I gave a new name. <laughs> now, my claim is that if we unpack what is going on in this one paragraph, we will have the whole of Twail before us. <laughs> Because we notice, you know, he pays tribute to the sovereigns who have financed this. Financing is always important. Have I done that properly? Have I, have I acknowledged all the, everyone who's uh, actually enabled this event to take place? I hope I did that properly. Um, and then he says, he does not know where he is because he believes he is in the Indies. The whole idea was to sail around to the Indies. He doesn't know where he is, but he sees many people and many islands and what is the first thing he does? He takes possession of them. This is a rather, you could say, unfriendly act, wouldn't you say, for a stranger to engage in. If a foreigner, if I come to Germany and say, well, thank you for inviting me, and now I'm taking possession <laughs> of all of you. So it's a little like that. And that is what Columbus does. It is a legal act that he engages in. Can you see how law comes into the picture immediately, because he has to establish that this is his property, or at least this is going to be the territory of his king. Take possession. And we can see how the royal standard is unfurled, but the problem we can see Columbus facing is the problem of what is the law that applies as between these two groups of people who have never encountered each other before. Because the whole idea of the legitimacy of law is that law is something that has to be agreed upon by the parties to whom that law applies. How can it be said that there is a particular law that the Indians have agreed to with respect to property, sovereignty, and all those other complex issues? Can we see the problem? What is the law? But Columbus deals with that because he says, I've taken possession for the highnesses by proclamation made and with royal standard unfurled, and no opposition was offered to me. <laughs> In other words, these people have consented to the, their own dispossession. So, Twell would say international law is not about sovereignty being made in the West, being transferred to the non-sovereign, non-European world. International law is about the issue of disempowerment, of the law being used 
to exclude people from the realm of sovereignty. That's what we see in this passage. Can we see that? And if that is the case, the question is, can we see how then that raises a different perspective, a different set of ideas that we should use in studying the history of international law? International law might be, all these doctrines might be, about dispossessing certain people while claiming all the time to liberate them. And that is the essence of the civilizing mission. And I won't, I, I'm already, I think, 30 minutes. I've got five minutes to deal with reparations. <laughs> okay. Uh, but basically my argument is that this is the essence of the civilizing mission. The idea is that these people are inferior, they need to be occupied, their lands need to be taken over, and this needs to be done for their own well-being. <laughs> we are being humane in taking on this great task. I was going to deal with the Indians in the 16th century, and then I was going to deal with the Berlin Conference of 1885, which is all about the civilizing mission. By the way, um, is the location or the premises of where the Berlin Conference was held still? No, it's right around the corner here. Yeah. It's right, why couldn't we have held the conference here, there? <laughs> no, the counter Berlin Conference. <laughs> Oh, the building's gone. Okay, that's a pity. <laughs> but maybe we should think of this as being the counter Berlin Conference. You know, the, the Berlin Conference of 2018. Okay. Okay, I've got a whole set of propositions there, but I won't go into that because I don't have time. Um, but the basic idea of the civilizing mission is we want to help these people, we want to save these people, so what do we do? We take over their lands and we use violence against them as part of the process of saving them. The structure of the civilizing mission, I would argue, has always been, in that sense, political, but it has also always been economic. Remember that Columbus was intent on trading. Uh, with, you know, trade was what drove the whole thing. So this is the forerunner of globalization, I would say. The civilizing mission now is all these different, I, okay, I, I won't deal with all this. <laughs> the, Modern, I, let me just say about the modern version of the civilizing mission. So I would say globalization itself is part of the civilizing mission. Countries must adopt these policies, must sign on to these international trade agreements and investment treaties in order to be civilized. Many of the international institutions are actively engaged in this whole process. So the very, very interesting about the civilizing mission is that there is no accountability that is established for those who engage in the mission. So if something goes wrong, nobody is responsible. And we can see that with the IMF and the World Bank, you can't really sue the IMF and the World Bank if something goes terribly wrong. Um, do any, any idea about how many children died as a result of UN sanctions on Iraq? Thank you, 500,000. 500,000 children died as a result of UN sanctions on Iraq, and this was established by Lancet. You know, the British, they always tell the truth. We can rely on their institutions. Why is there no international criminal claim being made against the United Nations? If any country had done this, it would be the subject of absolute outrage. But the United Nations, no. Actually, it's immune in these circumstances. The war on terror, again, this idea of denouncing certain people as being terrorists, being violent, and all these doctrines of preemption drones, etc., is the way in which an attempt is made once again to play a version of the civilizing mission. State building, we've got to create democratic states. Uh, responsibility to protect, who takes responsibility? So some of you might know of the responsibility to protect language, but basically the argument is certain states commit terrible atrocities against their people and in those circumstances intervention is needed. Now again, we know this is a very difficult issue because states do commit terrible atrocities. But think of the case of Libya. That co the concept of responsibility to protect was actually mentioned in the Security Council authorization of force in the case of Libya. And now I understand that the slave trade has returned to Libya. I don't know whether you've seen the news reports. But the World Bank says reassuringly, Libya is doing really well because it's now a middle income country. <laughs> So I wonder how much the slave trade contributes to that global you know, GNP. But who takes responsibility for the huge mess that exists now in Libya, all of which was undertaken in the name of humanity and rescuing these unfortunate people? International Criminal Court, I have put a question mark, please note. I don't know whether to see it as being a repro reproduction of this structure or not. And then I would say, is there a tension? So here the question is, 
Could it be the case that the economic forces of globalization caused the problems that then human rights and all these other types of activities try, often without much success, in attempting to do, to deal with? So to me, there's a question for human rights here, which is can human rights deal with globalization and make it more humane than the system of globalization we have now? I'm, I'm not against globalization. I'm against a particular form of globalization that seems to be in prevalence now, where according to, I think, Oxfam, something like 500 people are as wealthy as the three billion poorest people in the world. That seems to me problematic. <laughs> and we have to think about the structures which created this. I'm sorry, I'm not going to get to reparations. Let me just, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll just, I, I just outline the legal problem of reparations. The legal problems of reparations from an international law point of view are these. Intertemporal law. The argument is you cannot assess a particular event based on contemporary law. So the basic argument is genocide is a concept, a legal principle that was established after the Second World War. You cannot use the concept established after the Second World War to assess and judge events that took place in the 19th century. Can we see the argument? An event has to be assessed according to the law that applied at the time. Now, can we again see how colonialism plays into this role? Because at the time of colonialism, it was the colonizers who made the law. Because going back to Columbus, the colonized did not have sovereignty. They cannot participate in the making of law. Can we see that? So can we see how colonialism reproduces itself even in the realm of genocide with this issue? Then the forum question is, which, co which, case, which court will hear this particular case? And again, the court system has been created largely by the West, the International Court of Justice and so forth, and U European states have been very careful to make sure that their submission to the court does not easily allow any other country to bring a claim in the International Court of Justice claiming reparations. Damages, the whole problem of how do we assess the damages in these types of circumstances, all the complexities associated with that. Personality, what is the entity that will bring this case? Now, in Australia, there's a famous case called Marbo, which says, finally, Aborigines do have title, but that title can only be asserted by entities which have continuously occupied the land. Now, of course, the problem with colonialism is that it prevents people from continuously occupying the land. So can we see how these rules are shaped by the colonial powers which made the rules in the first place? <laughs> I would still like to think that there's a possibility of reparations, but, um, and this is where I was going to discuss the Nauru case, but I think I've already taken far too much time, so I won't, uh, I won't continue with that. But this is the citation, Nauru versus Australia case in the International Court of Justice in uh, June 2000, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1992, if some of you are interested. In, maybe in question time, if you all are interested, I'd be happy to talk more about that. Thank you very much.